I and colleagues, archaeologist in Hawaii. He's also a lecturer here at the University of Hawaii Manoa. And he's going to be teaching two courses in the fall that might interest you, especially after today's lecture. One is in Pacific Island archaeology, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon. And the other is on Hawaiian archaeology, and I'm going to be there. I can't wait. Dr. Dye received his bachelor's degree in anthropology at University of Hawaii at Manoa. He is a local boy. His master's degree and PhD both in anthropology at Yale. He has over 30 publications and a recent book on Hawaiian archaeology with Jim Damon, Hawaii's past and the world of Pacific Islands. He'll talk to us today about the latest in carbon-14 dating and examining Polynesian myths as clues to the past. One of the best lectures of the semester, I know I say that often, but really. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dyer. about the length of time for each 
um, generation in a genealogy, you can estimate when uh, Polynesians might have gotten to Hawaii. Kenneth Emery at Bishop Museum did this many years ago, um, back in the 19, early 1930s or late 1920s, I can't quite tell from my graph here. Um, and he, his guess was 900 to 1000 AD. There are other estimates. Uh, Judge Fornander uh, earlier, back in the 1800s, uh, estimated sometime around 400 or 500 AD. Uh, but that's just based on, on the traditions and, and the genealogical information that they contain. Uh, this, these dark, this dark band across the top here is a one and two standard deviation range of the estimate that I, um, I told you about earlier, about 1,000 to 1,100. When we get to the radiocarbon era, radiocarbon was invented by Willard Libby in Chicago um, in the outgrowth of the nuclear program that ended World War II. Um, some of the first states uh, in the Pacific were from Hawaii, and basically what happened the first three decades, almost four decades, um, after the events of radiocarbon dating, as archaeologists used it, uh, they, their estimates progressively deviated from the correct answer. And this, this was a methodological problem that they had. Uh, they were dating old wood. Um, the radiocarbon dating method dates when things were growing. As most of you know, uh, because you're in the natural sciences, the heartwood of a long-lived tree can be five or six hundred years old. In fact, it turns out that, that Opiakua uh, in forests uh, behind Hilo Town uh, is often six or seven hundred years old uh, before it's blown down, uh, gets old and gets blown down in storms. So, cumulative result of these errors, and um, quite frankly, archaeologists always like to find the oldest things, so there's some social pressure to have an older estimate than the guy that came before you, led archaeologists for several generations, uh, for several decades, sorry, away from uh, the correct answer. And it wasn't until um, uh, a New Zealander and an Australian got involved and said, hey, this is not right, um, and they did uh, this thing here, uh, they got us back on track. There was a bunch of arguments for the last 20 or 30 years we've had archaeologists divided into two camps, one liking a short chronology and another liking a long chronology. But the thing that really changed it was this here, this work uh, by uh, Steve Athens, uh, who took a paleo environmental core from Oregon Pond um, at the Barbers, outer Barbers Point and really set um, the dating uh, effort on the track uh, because, and I'll, sh and I'll tell you about that later. You can see there's still some blowback, uh, but finally now uh, all of the estimates are, are clustered around uh, this estimate here. How do we get that estimate? Okay. Um, first thing is we set up a model uh, to do this, and we divided uh, Hawaii's past into two periods. Uh, one pre-Polynesian settlement and the second one post-Polynesian settlement. And they're divided by the discovery date uh, when Polynesians got here. And it was possible to go back and uh, look through the Ordi Pond uh, paleoenvironmental core and find seeds that came from um, down below uh, where we have evidence for humans and so we have evidence then for the pre-Polynesian period. Um, and then for the post-Polynesian period, what I did is look through the, um, uh, the literature for dates on charcoal that, was, that, that burned plants that Polynesians brought to the islands. Okay? So we're certain that we have something that's post-Polynesian. Okay? Because those plants were not here prior um, to um, Polynesian discovery of the islands. So that, that got me these estimates, which are a little low and, and not very precise. What you're looking for here, uh, which you guys probably know, but which I have to tell the archaeologists, um, is that what's good in statistics is tall and skinny and not short and fat. Um, and so what um, my colleagues did, Steve Athens and Tim Reed, is they came back and they they found an extra 22,000 or so, 26 maybe, 
um, dates from the archaeological literature that fit criteria that allowed them to be placed into the pre-Polynesian or post-Polynesian period. We ran the calibration again, and you can see we got better, uh, we get better results from this. So we think we're on the right track with this estimate, and that we're not wandering around blind in the woods like our colleagues have been. Now I meant, I mentioned earlier that um, we were confident that we had dates from uh, a pre pre-Polynesian period uh, here in Hawaii. And our confidence comes from the, this, this incredible paleo-environmental quality that Steve Athens took at Horton Pond um, out of Harbors Point. And what I want to, um, Cindy, do you, do you folks know how to read these? Do your, your, your students know how to read these? They're a little bit funky. Um, what you're seeing here are percentages of various kinds of pollen and other small particles uh, from the sediments that are taken from a core at the bottom of a lake, basically. Uh, Steve goes out on a raft, he puts down his, his fancy core, and he drives his core down. It's designed in such a way that it doesn't mix up the sediment as it comes up. So he pulls it out, it's in an aluminum tube, he cuts the aluminum tube with a saw, opens it up, and there he finds very finely banded sediment. And you can see that he's got many, many samples through, um, through his core. What happens then is that pollen and other small particles are extracted from the sediment and identified by specialists. And on that basis, we get, we get these things. So you can see these various herbs here, unknowns, ferns over here. Uh, but what was important for us in determining the, the distinction between, or what was important for Steve Athens, uh, for distinguishing between the pre-Polynesian phase and the post-Polynesian phase, is that there's an absolute lack of charcoal particles at the bottom of this core. And this is true not only at Ordi Pond, but at several other coring locations on Oahu Island. Now the reason for this, the reason for the lack of charcoal, is that the old northern islands of the group have not seen any volcanic activity for a long, long time, and there's no good natural uh, source of there's no good source of natural fires here, and so we get over and over again on the northern islands uh, this thing where there's no charcoal at the base of, of the paleo environmental cores. Of course, it's much different now on, on Maui, on the southern islands, the younger southern islands, Maui, Hawaii Island. Hawaii Island still you know, has been erupting for the last 25 years. Um, so natural forest fires occur on a regular basis on, on those newer islands. And we can't use this particular sign of, of pre-Polynesian um, uh, process there. So getting back to here, what you see are trees and shrubs. Uh, this is the pollen from trees and shrubs. And this one here, well, let's do this one. Let's do the grasses, I'm sorry. Uh, this one here is the actual percentages here, okay, which you can read off of this body scale. And then this one here is, uh, I forget if it's a five or a ten times um, amplification of that signal. And the reason that's done is because oftentimes well, thousands and thousands of uh, pollen grains are identified here. For many kinds of pollen, there are only a few grains found. And so for them to show up on a diagram like this, like for this one here, this Fabaceae, that's a P, some kind? I don't know. Thank you. I don't, I don't know the, the Latin names for all the plants. Uh, but you can see this one wouldn't show up at all unless it was amplified in that way. So these look a little bit funky, but they're, they're full of information. And of course, they gave us the information that we needed to estimate uh, when pollinations got to um, Hawaii. Okay, let's talk about settlement as a process. Hawaii is the most isolated landmass in the world. Um, and for a people, the Polynesian people, who uh, very rapidly settled about uh, settled islands, in an ocean that covers about a third of the globe, even getting here and, and settling, 
uh, was a major technological achievement that really stretched the limits of, of the capacities that they developed at that time. Uh, so the voyages of Hope Lea showed, um, the voyage between the homeland, which was down in the islands of uh, the Polynesian islands of what we now call the Marquesas and the Society Islands of Tahiti. Um, that voyage is very difficult uh, for a sailing vessel because you have to go through the doldrums, which is a, most of you probably know, is the area around the equator where the trade winds don't blow. Okay, the southern or northern trades don't blow there. Um, and so you get a, a place that's very confusing for a sailor um, and for um, uh, sailors who are, are sailing based on, they're getting their direction based on the swell, the winds, and the stars, doldrums are uh, what uh, I know what Thompson called a mess because you don't know where you are. It gets cloudy, the, the swells are, are going every which way, um, and uh, oftentimes you wonder if you're going to get through. When you get out the other side, you really don't know where you are. Uh, for these reasons, we think that the settlement process was likely multi-generational. Okay? It wasn't like a matter of people just coming here uh, and finding themselves here um, and being successful. It was a multi-generational thing uh, where a, a, a group of people from the Marquesas or the Society Islands kept at it generation after generation uh, to make the settlement of Hawaii work. Polynesians introduced about 30 different useful plants to Hawaii. As most of you know, uh, there, there wasn't much here in the way of plant food uh, to eat. So all the major food crops, the, the kalo and that kind of thing, were brought up by Polynesians. Polynesians also introduced pigs, dogs, chickens, and rats. Okay, there were no, except for a bat, there were no mammals here um, at all before the Polynesians got here. Um, direct dating that we've got on these materials indicates that rats and kukui nut trees were the first to be introduced um, and that rats had a major effect on the native flora and fauna. Large flightless birds, which you probably know about from this class, uh, could compete with the rats, uh, especially the ground dwelling and these ground dwelling uh, flightless birds. Little bitty wings can fly around. Uh, they go extinct almost immediately after Polynesian, uh, Polynesian settlement. Um, and we see from the pollen that the three dominant forest trees and shrubs decline sharply. Fantail palm, Maulu, uh, which is making a comeback now because it's, a, it's widely uh, prized as a decorative plant. Uh, Kanaloa kaho'olavensis, uh, which is known from two specimens in the wild. Um, Aali'i, uh, which is a very common firewood plant in North Hawaii. Uh, but one of the things that came of this uh, was that the, uh, these declines are probably due to uh, the influence of the Polynesian rat. Uh, it was a forager able to eat seeds and nuts much more efficiently uh, than the flightless birds that were here. And it looks to have had a, a a really stunning effect on the forest. And that effect softened the forest for subsequent clearing and farming. So it was actually beneficial, uh, this, this environmental change was beneficial from the point of view of farmers, uh, Polynesian farmers who uh, got to the honest. Now having said that, and I'll give you more details in a minute, Archaeologists have very little evidence for the first 400 years after Polynesian settlement. Um, you can read a lot of archaeological books and think that archaeologists know exactly what happened in the first 400 years, uh, but it's not the case. We really don't have much direct evidence um, for the first four centuries after the Polynesian discovery of the islands. Back to Steve's um, pollen diagram here. This is one half of it. You can see I've cut it off here. If I ran the whole thing across here, it would be so small that it would be even more hopeless for you to try to figure it out. Okay? I've already pointed out um, the uh, 
trees and shrubs here versus herbs. This is a slightly different um, uh, presentation here. So you see trees and shrubs here. These are herbs and these are unknowns down here. So you're tracking the relative frequencies of these things through time. So you can see here that the division between A and B is this is the pre-Polynesian phase, this is the Polynesian phase here, B, and C1 and C2 are modern uh, post-European uh, contact uh, parts of the paleo-environmental core. <coughs> so you can see basically what happened is that there's a period of clearing trees for uh, the native lowland forest basically uh, for agricultural fields that continues through the Polynesian period. It accelerates early on in the historic period uh, with the introduction of cattle um, and uh, other, for, other herbivores that uh, really do damage uh, to the, the remaining forests. Um, and then in, in the latest periods you see the trees bouncing back. Uh, this has a lot to do with uh, the fact that people, most people were moving off of the land at that time and moving into cities. Yeah. You see the, the three plants that I mentioned earlier, um, Dotnea viscosa, this is Aalii, it's a small shrub, um, Kanoa holabensis here, um, and then Picharia here, which is the Lowu. What you see is that they're, they're very well represented. We don't even have to use the amplification to see them on this column diagram right until charcoal shows up in, in the paleo environmental record. And after that, there's just a precipitous decline. And now we believe at this period that there are very few Polynesian people here, uh, but the Polynesian rat um, is vegan. You bring, a, you bring a one pregnant female rat here, and according to Alan Ziegler, within two decades, they can be at carrying capacity on all of the islands. Okay? So very, very rapidly, and that shows up strikingly uh, in, in this in paleo environmental core. Um, Kanaloa Koholabensis is a really neat story um, from an archaeological point of view. Uh, it's, a, I think, a real triumph uh, uh, of the work that Steve Athens did when he took this core, because um, this was initially identified as unidentified, if, that's, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just described as a certain shape. And nobody knew who it was. Um, Steve's uh, colleagues went to herbaria around the world to look at plants from Hawaii to get more pollen to see if they could find them at. They couldn't find anything. And it wasn't until uh, some botanists climbed a sea stack, a small little sea stack off Kahol Lave about 20 years ago, and found a, a plant that they didn't recognize that just happened to be flowering, which they collected, um, that we know that this is this plant, Kanaloa Kaholabensis. Okay? That name is a recent one, obviously. Uh, because the plant was unknown to science before about 20 years ago. Uh, what happened after it was, uh, it was discovered, um, uh, Steve heard about it, and he said, I want to see the pollen from that. So they shook a little pollen out of the flowers they collected and sent it off to the pollen analyst, and he said, we have a match. Okay, so we know the history of that plant, those two little uh, surviving plants um, out of the sea stack, uh, had a long history uh, and really uh, took a blow when the, when the rat was introduced to a white pot pollen issues. Okay, you can see other things here. This is Kiabe, which is introduced as cattle feed in the historic period. Um, and this is Koahale, uh, which is one of the banes of my existence as a young man because I had to clear so much of it to see the archaeological sites. Okay, let's I want to talk next about transported landscapes. We've got Polynesians to the islands now. Um, we've seen that the, um, the Polynesian rat that was introduced uh, was probably the first voyagers, uh, really had a tremendous effect on the natural history of the islands. Um, 
But this idea of transported landscapes, it comes from a, a geographer at Berkeley uh, back in the 1950s who, who noted that when people settle new areas, they do their best to make it looked like the place that they just came from. Okay, we could see that here in Hawaii uh, in the recent period after the how they got here. They made a city, Honolulu, that looks a lot like cities that are on the mainland. Okay? You can you can tell apart a little bit. I mean, we've got a lot more palm trees than most cities on the mainland, but the city looks the same. And Polynesians did the same thing when they got here. The islands that they found here. Um, Beautiful as they are, um, as verdant as they were, really didn't have what Polynesians need to make a living. And so they set about transporting landscapes, not only the animals and the plants, but the landscapes that they knew back in the home island and established them here. Archaeologists then find a second wave of introductions about two to three centuries after the Polynesian discovery. It includes things like breadfruit, he, uh, ipu, and a sweet potato. Um, and then we start to get some archaeological information three centuries, three or four centuries after uh, Polynesian uh, discovery. So I want to tell you a bit about that. Oops. Okay, this is some work that um, I did with colleagues um, over a period of about. 15 or 18 years um, on the Waimanalo Plain, uh, Bellows Air Force Base, uh, home of the famous 018 site. It's a very early excavation from the 1960s. Uh, it's well publicized. It's one of our horror sites uh, for archaeology in Hawaii. Uh, but it's just part of a larger settlement pattern. We've now divided up into uh, these five sites here. You can see these other sites are, are quite a bit bigger. Uh, but basically, you have a sandy plain here uh, with some uplifted coral, that's what these bumps are, um, fronting up against the Kaoli Hills, which are volcanic here. Okay. So if you, if you go out and you can get to the beach here, this is the second guard shack, and, and the public beach at Waimanalo is right here, uh, site 4851 behind there. Uh, and then if you're in the military, you can pass a second gate, or if you have a military pass, you get here uh, to the military only beach, which is a recreation area for our servicemen and women, uh, mostly high ranking servicemen and women, uh, and a sweet place to spend a vacation. Uh, but we have these uh, sites here. Now, this is Puha Stream, also known as Waimanalo Stream, running through here. Uh, it's channelized today, but in the past, we used to wander through the sand, uh, we around the streams do. Uh, and these are about a 10 or 15 minute walk. Uh, north um, to the hills here. On the other side of this is Kao Hao, known today uh, by most people as Lani Kao. Okay. The end of title. Now, what I want to show you um, is up north here, um, the, the two sites, we're going to look at um, the plants identified in charcoal from fire pits. And we have a Forget now how many fire pits uh, on the order of 40 or so fire pits that we found in our archaeological excavations over the last uh, 15 or 18 years. And we've collected all the charcoal from these fire pits. Uh, it has two really nice properties. One, we can uh, get all the charcoal identified. Uh, a woman named Gail Murakami, who works with Steve Atkins at International Archaeology, is able to section uh, pieces of charcoal three different ways. One long way, one across, and one diagonally. Look at the pattern of the cells and tell you what plant was used. Okay, so we have real good data on the different kinds of plants that were used. The other thing that's nice about it is that we can date the charcoal. And so we have little points across the plane here uh, where we know what people were burning at a particular point in time. We take care when we're dating to date short-lived uh, plants such as shrubs. Um, Elima is a really good one. Ali is another good shrub uh, for dating because they don't live a long time. And so we're not building in this old wood um, problem that we saw earlier on 
uh, when I showed that uh, colorful slide of the guesses about the colonization period. And, and what we find from this, when we, when we look at it all together, is that we have a record that really relates to local processes in the past. I'm going to show you one plant here, um, how um, hibiscus tiliaceous, which most of you are familiar with, is the one that grows all crazy shaped, um, usually down alongside streams. Okay, um, it's got a pretty kind of orange hibiscus flower. Up here in the north, most of the fire pits don't have any power in them. Only one of the fire pits that we've excavated had power. But as we get down close to the stream here, what we find is almost every single one of these fire pits has power. So people are not typically bringing in firewood um, from local plants and uh, from far away. They're collecting firewood very close to where uh, they're building fire. So we have a record that's not only constrained very nicely in time, uh, but also spatially um, as well. If we look at these over time, these are the conventional radiocarbon ages. Um, so these won't, you can't get back from this slide, you can't tell exactly how old these are. This one is a about 700 years ago, but because the uh, radiocarbon dating, um, that's not going to be you know, seven, it's not going to be 2015 minus 700. But these are in relative order here, okay? And what we see if we put them in relative order is that the, the proportion of introduced taxa changes over time, okay? These are Polynesian introductions. So early on, people are taking uh, wood from the native forest that's there, and over time, the, the plane is transformed so that it includes a, very, a, a large number of Polynesian-introduced plants. Okay? You can see that here. In fact, right here, about 400 um, BP is what we call them, the great ages. About 400 BP. Um, is when the, the change seems to have occurred uh, in this data. We find that the proportion of local firewood also changes. So early on we have a pattern where people are bringing firewood down to the plane from Mocha. And we know that because we have species that today are living only well back of this of uh, Waimanalo town on the slopes of the Kokolau Mountains. Okay. So we see a real change in behavior where people are initially having to bring firewood down to the plain, uh, presumably because the plants that were there in the native forest weren't good enough uh, for a good fire. Uh, and that changes over time as the transported landscape takes hold. When was that? When the 400 BP in radiocarbon years turns out to be about AD 1450, perhaps a little bit later. So it's not until four or five hundred years after Polynesians first discovered the island that we see the first signs of transported landscapes being established and working for the Polynesian people. Okay? So it gives you an idea of the tempo of the changes. Uh, that took place in all of Hawaii um, as Polynesians had an effect on the natural history of the islands. I want to talk a little bit about agricultural innovation. Okay, we've seen how Polynesians came here and reproduced the kind of place that they came from. Uh, but these folks, uh, were very creative as well. Um, they're inventive and creative. And so I want to talk to a little bit about uh, sweet potato, because the introduction of the sweet potato brought about really major changes to the landscape. Now, unlike most of the plants and animals that were introduced to Hawaii by Polynesians, uh, the sweet potato's origin is in South America. The rest of the plants and animals came from Southeast Asia. So Ipu, the gourd, and uh, Uala, the sweet potato, both came um, from South America. 
When they came, the agricultural potential of Hawaii Island tripled. Let that sink in. The agricultural potential of Hawaii Island, our big island, tripled. Okay? And it doubled um, on the island of Maui, another one of our large islands. Okay? Rain-fed agriculture spread to large fields on the geologically young islands of Maui and Hawaii, and we'll look at that. And on the, old, on the geologically older islands, sucatans were typically grown on colluvial soils um, just above the floodplains of the rivers. Um, we're going to look at the leeward Pahala field system, because uh, this one's very well documented. Um, it's, it's also drop-dead gorgeous. Um, and it, and because of the work that archaeologists have done there, it offers a really unique opportunity. Um, we're going to look at its structure, uh, because the structure of the field system allows us to date it very, very closely. Um, there are about 100,000 features in the field system that we can do this relative dating thing that I'm going to show you. And when we combine that with the 14C date that's been done, we can get really, really precise results. Uh, what we find from that is that the earliest um, establishment of uh, sweet potato production in the field system uh, was in the 1400s sometime, but it was intensified greatly in the late 17th and 18th century, uh, probably to support the growth of large herds of pigs. Okay, it's one of its major functions. So what we see here is an increasing tempo of change, uh, the influence of Polynesian on Hawaiian natural history, and, a, pi and a, a picture of Hawaii changing rapidly at the time of European contact. This is um, the results of some GIS work that an archaeologist in uh, New Zealand did, Thane Latifog, a uh, graduate of the University of Hawaii, by the way. How am I doing on time? When, when are we finish? Okay, I think we'll do it. Um, and this shows in green here irrigated agricultural fields in Old Hawaii, and in red, rain fed or dry land agricultural fields. And the Leeward Kahala field system is this one here. Um, as you can see, the Kona field system, another major dry land field system uh, that we uh, archaeologists have learned a bit about, um, and then come down here in Kabu that nobody has ever studied. But what you can see is up on the northern islands, um, we get a, a uh, uh, basically only um, irrigated agriculture. Uh, and so the sweet potato had less of an effect in the northern islands than it did in the southern islands. This is the Leeward Kohala field system here. Um, it, it runs back from the coast. The lower limit is defined uh, by uh, rainfall. Makaya here, or toward the ocean from here, is too dry to support agriculture. And the upper limit is also determined by rainfall, but here it's too wet. And what happens is that the rainfall um, is so great that it leaches necessary nutrients from the soil, and fertility for sweet potatoes goes down. So it's rainfall uh, that determines the north, I mean, the, the Malka and Makaya boundaries of this. The field system itself covers 60 square kilometers. It's one of the largest archaeological sites um, in the state. This is what it looks like um, from a pool. You can see these low agricultural walls here and the trails running up from the coast down here uh, in the fields. Look at all the walls in here. These were developed because of the famous winds of Kohala. Kamakani o Kohala. These guys blow. Okay? When we're doing our work out in the field, we're often using plane table, making plane table maps. We have a table like this. You have to stay this way to the wind, because if you go like this, and it kind of knocks you off your feet. In fact, I have one little guy working for me who's about five foot four. He got lifted up and tossed down by the winds of Kohala. Okay? What these, these guys do, um, we think that the sugar cane was planted on them to help break the wind. Uh, but also what they do is they corrugate the surface so that you get a turbulent wind flow. It lifts the wind up off the ground so it doesn't shred the leaves of the sweet potato. 
This is an agricultural innovation. These are farmers who didn't know anything about this sweet potato plant brought from South America and learned how to grow it in an environment that was hostile to it. And they, they grew it in great abundance. This is a LIDAR image of a portion of the field system uh, that Thane Latifoga published. You can see here 200 meters across, so we're looking at less than a kilometer across here. Look at this thing, how completely this environment was transformed um, by the sweet potato fields. Okay, you can see the trails coming up from the coast, the coast is down here, um, and all these walls are going across. Now, you can see this on Google Earth today. This is pasture land, it's a Parker Ranch here. Um, and you can see the walls running over the past, uh, under the pasture. Here. Okay? You can barely see it on Google Earth. You should go on Google Earth and just do this um, instead of having me show you these slides. This, I like this one because we see three different periods. Um, this is the latest period with the McMansion down here and a water bill that's just got to be through the roof. Okay? There's pools and stuff here. Here you see ranching. This is a, a, a reservoir for the cattle who would be fed here. So there's a pipe running to this trough here. And you can see lines radiating out. Those are the cattle pastures. And so the cows, which you can see right here, they're all in this pasture. They'll come here, get a drink of water. The Paniolo will close this gate, open this one here, and then the, the cattle will go out this way. Um, and graze out over here. And lastly, the oldest stuff that you see is the Kohala field system back up in here. So you're seeing three eras of land development, uh, courtesy of Google Earth, what a tremendous tool that is. What we found is that these trails, everywhere there's an intersection of a trail and a wall, either the trail goes over the wall, in which case the wall was older than the trail, or the wall ends at a pre-existing trail, in which case the trail is older than the wall. If we code this in a computer this way, we can draw a directed graph that shows these relationships. So wall C is older than trail 1, and trail 1 is older than walls A and B. Now why do this? Because with a directed graph, we can study the structure of the entire field system, all 100,000 um, chronological relationships. AT&T used these same computer algorithms to analyze the structure of the telephone network in the United States. Okay, so math is there, computers are there, and we can learn something. So we have two maps that we can do this with. The whole field system is here. I'm going to show you this one at Lapakaki and this one at Pakina Kina and. Um, um, Kahua 1. Okay? Here's what it looks like in Google Earth at Lapakahi. These were the first features that we can distinguish. A trail coming in up here, another trail coming in up here, and the first walls. In the second period, two additional trails put in, actually three, so it's split. Uh, and this one extended up here, and a number of walls filling in. And then the last phase that we can distinguish is right here. Okay. The second one at Pahina Hina and Kahua 1. Oops. Gosh, these are out of order. I'm sorry. Um, what we see in that first phase, the group one walls, those were built midway between the time of Umi Ali Law, Hawaii Island chief, and Kalani Oku, who was chief of Hawaii Island when Cook got here. Okay, so the first walls were built just at the end of the 17th century here. That second group of walls was built, um, and they kind of got an orange color there um, in uh, my slide, were built just before the time of Kalani Ohu, up in that range of time. And then the last walls were built after Cook got here. Okay, so let's take a look at how this went in Pahina Hina. You can see there's a um, there's a swale running down here that's kind of divided this, um, this part of the field system in two. But you can see two trails coming up and the first walls, more, more trails and walls, and finally a last trail was planted at Pahina. 
That's all I have to tell for, uh, for you today. Any questions? We have a couple minutes. That's a problem um, in most places, uh, but the consistency of the paleo environmental forest from the northern islands of Oahu and Hawaii, we find the bottom of these there is no charcoal. And there's no natural reason why that should be, except that there were no fires back then. And what we see is, you know, it's wet enough here, uh, we, have, we have lightning very infrequently. It typically doesn't start forest fires, as it does sometimes in the American Southwest. Um, and there's no volcanic activity to start forest fires down there. Okay. How are your walls constructed? Are they like fish pond walls or different? Oh, the walls of the field system? Uh, the walls there are low. Um, they're, they're way lower than uh, your knee, and, and they're wide. And they're really, um, you can make them today with a garden rake. So you go through and you just pull garden rake through the soil, and it pulls any block about this size your way. So you just mound those up at the edge of, of the field. Um, and so you get these, these long, low walls. Um, what are the ag innovations of um, taro farming and the fish ponds compared to that of the sweet potato farming? Is that sweet potato farming was um, later than those two innovations and possibly accompanied with like a population spike? Or how do those three interact together over history? Thank you for asking that. One of the surprises in the lecture today is that my pictures of the, uh, of the Lohi disappear. I don't know where they went. Um, the, um, your question, though, about whether they came first, we presume that they came first. But archaeologists have yet to date Loki very successfully. So we don't have good data. We presume that they were earlier, because Kala was here presumably earlier than sweet potato, which had to come from uh, South America after Polynesians discovered South America and then sailed back with the, with the sea tip. Fish ponds, same thing. We don't, we haven't been able to, um, uh, to date them very successfully. I tried about 20 years ago, and, and my idea is we could just take the sediments from the bottom of the fish pond in a very still environment, a shallow water environment. Um, I thought we could just take the sediments from that and figure out when they were built. That turned out not to be the case because the fish ponds were cleaned so well by their, by their users. Um, and so what we have to do is go back and get under the walls of the fish ponds and find material that you know is older than the fish pond wall uh, to try to get that lower bound for it and, and figure out when those are built as well. So we really don't have a clue about when the fish pond uh, technology, which is another tremendous innovation, was it was invented here. There is no precursor for it along the path of Polynesian migration to the land. And where you get it in Southeast Asia is actually later than, than um, the Polynesian discovery of these islands. That's the best I can do. Thanks. Any other questions?